and um, the uh, one of the actresses that we had in that film um, was Amber Heard. It was her first film. I thought that would be the one you were talking about. Yeah, and um, so once I got that that finished, it took a long time to get it edited because we made a ton of mistakes. Uh, but the guys over at Blockbuster happened to be uh, a local corporation in Dallas. They had their headquarters here. So the the distributor that Half Head Fred had used, I contacted and he said he would buy the film and we were just excited. So he had a, a meeting with Blockbuster and said uh, he wanted to meet me afterwards. So I went early because I wanted to meet the Blockbuster guy. And then the guy was like, oh, hey, so you did that film, blah, blah, blah. And he was saying, oh, yeah, you know, what I liked about it was that you moved the camera around a lot. Like, you didn't just have the camera sitting on a tripod. Like, it was in action the whole time running around. And he goes, that really, you know, that was one of the things that excited us about it. So that was kind of good information. So I was thinking, okay, so they, you know, they really look, they do, they do try to find some kind of production value. How did you project. achieve that? Did you uh, use, like, city cams or, like, dollies? well yeah we did build this dolly um out of pvc pipe and a bunch of stuff i think we used once after it took us forever to set up but mostly we had one of those uh glider cam rigs which is like a pole with a weight on the bottom of it that's yeah. supposed to counter balance and it has like a, a gimbaled handle that you can hold so that you can walk around um so and then i could i could use uh, the the end of it where the weight was, I could push it back and it would kind of set on my belt buckle. And I could, so that way I could kind of stand and hold instead of having to set up a tripod. Because what happened, we, first of all, the house we were shooting in the floor as you would walk would just cave in. Right. And, and <laughs> so we had to lay down plywood around the areas where you could walk. So you, I had to wear big boots and, and there was no way you're going to set up, uh, you know, um, a tripod and to move around and we were and we were trying to cover tons of pages i had you know i made the rookie mistake of having way too many speaking characters so you know we have an ensemble cast i'm trying to trying to get coverage and so there was you know you just had to you couldn't set the camera on a tripod you had to keep moving and going around and you know i mean i would keep asking people hey have you said have i has have i filmed you yet no not yet and i'd be like okay <laughs> <laughs> do your lines and i you know because i just get confused it was so much trying to keep uh, up with with everything that was going on and people coming and going uh especially in the in the more chaotic action scenes and uh but the one thing that we did have going for us is that house did look really cool and it had like years of wallpaper that was peeling off and everything looked real sketchy and just it looked very set like like it had been designed to look as horrifying as possible and we took we, we took a bunch of pieces of old wood and, and nailed them over the windows so that it looked like it had been boarded up but they were you know nailed in such a way that you could see out easily so that characters could come to the window and scream in there and uh, things like that so and then we had a big bonfire scene that we did um, and just poured gas on a bunch of old wood that we found and drug a bunch of stuff the one thing that 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 was surprising uh, is uh, because I'd never filmed really anything, but certainly not in the woods. So there was a bunch of cows out there. And I guess as soon as it starts to get dark, the cows all start mooing. So we would lose about an hour where you couldn't have any dialogue yeah. because there was just cows all around. And I mean, they were so loud. Yeah. And then they would stop and the coyotes would start going. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, gosh, man, can we not get a break out here? It's like, is everything want to make noise? Well, did that force you to do like uh, a lot of ADR on it or? No way, man. These kids, there was, you know, none of these actors had ever acted. <laughs> like ADR would have been impossible. Some of the stuff that we did ADR, it was mostly off camera stuff. So I was like, can, we'll just have you say this off camera to kind of fill in the gap here or fill in the gap there. And that was uh, side effects, right? Yeah. Because I started that one, but then I got distracted by another one. So I have to uh, go back to it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fun one, you know, it's, um, it's kind of silly. And then we got, uh, you know, again, part of it is just trying to find cheap locations. And somebody told me, hey, you know, you can shoot in the library for free. I was like, what? Well, <laughs> I guess, yeah, there's a scene now in the library. Awesome. So, and uh, once we got to the library, they were like, yeah, um, you can't close it down, but you can, you, you know, we can let you film here. So, uh, so there was like some stairwells that were really cool. They have a, a, 
like an archive book section where the where they can where the the shelves squeeze in and they can they they got like a crank and they can make the shelves close and open up so i can have like a character standing in the bookshelf and then the shelves start to close in on them awesome and you know so we just had to find like a sections of the library where there was no people and then we would shoot until somebody would come and then we would stop and then so um and that, i think that added some production value so it oh, looked yeah. like we you know we had and then some stuff downtown after hours it was pretty good so this was you know early 2000s so like 2004 i think and the art the downtown in dallas was pretty much dead at night so i mean you could you could run a generator and pretty much own the street do whatever you wanted and the cops would come by and ask what you were up to and then you know just say good luck and drive off and nobody nobody really harassed you or anything and so it kind of was almost like having a back lot Perfect. where you could get some cool stuff, but you know, you just didn't have extras or people walking around, but other than that, it was good. So that was the, and then once, once that thing was totally completed, you know, then I had, you know, then there's the Foley and all that stuff, uh, part of it, the, the music, how do you, know, how are we going to design the sound where, where you get the music? Um, and then a friend of mine's, you know, he produces some, some tracks. So we used a lot of his tracks and stuff, but then there was just those creepy sounds and buildups and stuff. So we just kind of created those ourselves. Then there's, you know, color correction, which, you know, at that time was basically just tries to get it as close as possible, but you know, I didn't really know what I was doing and trying to level off all the sounds and then to try to create the deliverables and that's when they come and they say okay so we'll buy the film but we need these things and they want you know so the sound has to be split up so you have they have to have a track where there's no dialogue but all the music and all the sound effects are there just no dialogue so that they can dub in something else and then you so you have to have those splits so you have to have a music and um, sound effects split which most of the sound effects were actually the actual sounds from the shoot. I didn't add anything. Perfect. But then once you cut that, once you cut that dialogue track out, you lose the sound effects. So you're oh, like, oh God, yeah. yeah. So you have to go in and painstakingly try to cut around and see what you can salvage and then create the rest on your own. So me and a buddy, we set up the microphone and in the in the in my house and tried to recreate as many of the the sounds as as we could to to create a track and then lay those all together and and then export them at the right levels. And then you have to match there are certain things that they have to do because they run it through a quality control system and they'll they'll look to see if there's any errors or anything that would keep it from passing. And then they kick it back and say, nope, didn't pass, you have to do it. And that costs money every time. Oh boy. You know? And then they want it delivered on um, HD tape, you know? that we didn't have access to those type of decks back then, you know, that was still before. So we had mini DV, which is what we shot it on, but they wanted that thing on big industrial tape. So we had to find a post house that would, that allow us to, to transfer the entire film over to one of those. So, and then, then we were able to deliver. And then from there, it went on to go into blockbusters and all those places and actually did really well that's awesome so it was a big fan favorite of the people who worked in a lot of the guys who worked in the video stores would always come up and be like oh yeah that i love that film we used to play it all the time that's great which, which was the same same reaction i got to the second film that we did which was called she's crushed the guys at the video stores like that one a lot i just watched that one I what like you, that a lot. Did you? Yes. I could not believe how good that was. I mean, Aww. cinematography is different than yeah. the, the other one. Man, that movie, I was hooked. I was so pissed. I was upset. I had the whole roller coaster of emotion and I was devastated at the end. It was perfect. That was a <laughs> good movie. It was really good. What's now crazy that's... is that, uh, women love the film men tend to have a little bit you know so the harshest criticism i got was from guys uh, you know oh i felt like i had to shower after that thing it was so <laughs> evil and it was the worst and i'm like yeah well you know maybe it was the bleach enemas 
<laughs> it's a, there's a lot of things going on, man. You know, like it, but it was too, it was too female empowering for them. I think uh... if you, if you, you know, you may not have picked up on it, but it, the film kind of sets itself up that it's going to play in a certain direction. You're like, okay, I get where this is going. And then right. it, at about the 40 minute mark, it just goes off the rails into yes. a completely different direction and tone. Yeah. And that's when the guys are like, wait, you, you lured me in and then you <laughs> fuck up the whole deal. <laughs> in fact, the, it got in a film festival called Shocker Fest. And uh, so I sent it in. The guy's like, oh, we, you know, the, the screener broke. Can you send us another screener? And I was like, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll have to get that. And then he was like, you know, he goes, you know what? You're in, from what we've seen, which I think was the first like 30 minutes. He's like, I love this film. You know, we're gonna let you in. Just get us the get us the good version so we can screen that one for the actual audience. So, I was like, okay. And so then I, I, you know, there wasn't like an urgent need to get it to them. So I got it to them probably two weeks out. So we get to the fe- to the thing. It's out in San Francisco, and um, the guy is kind of cold, being really cold. The guy that runs it, nobody's being very generous, you know, and it's like very minimal. So I had uh, met these other guys who had made a film called um uh, it was it was it was i don't know if you've seen it it's like um it's about the 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 little girl who performs an operation on her neighbor to take out her organs for her sister yes i did see that one i forget what it's called but i yeah it's like yeah it's kind of a yeah so uh, those guys had had their shorts there yeah and so you know, obviously we bonded. And then, um, so we were talking about some of the films that were there and, and, and we were waiting on, and, and so I had one of them go up and ask the director, he's like, hey, so what's, you know, what's the deal? And he was like, oh man, that film, you know, we don't want it in our festival. It's not, you know, it's too, it was too graphic and crazy. And, you know, and so I think he saw the first 30 minutes and thought it was going to be a certain type of film. And then it turned out to be something completely different, but they'd already told me that it could be in it and we'd already made arrangements. So they had to show it. Oh, good. So <laughs> in order to in order to punish us because they didn't want to show it, they showed it as the last film in their entire festival. So it was on Sunday at like five o'clock. Oh and God. they um, they screened it before it came on. They allowed one of these like some local film club to show a short that they had made about an old guy with Alzheimer's disease walking around a park quoting Abraham Lincoln okay <laughs> and so it is like not a horror film nothing completely and i don't know who made it and i think he was a friend of whoever was a festival program or something but he it was some are older because the audience for that screening f- suddenly started to fill up with a bunch of older people and when i mean older i'm talking 60 and up oh right? so i'm like wow there's a lot of uh gray-haired people here for our screening (laughs) i was like i didn't think our film would appeal to that audience and then i see why because this 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 fucking abraham lincoln thing was going on so i was like oh that's why they're here so of course you know older people once they get out of the house they're in no hurry to rush back home so they're like oh let's watch this next film (laughs) surprise (laughs) yes oh my god (laughs) After the film was done, I got up and, you know, they do like, you know, how you get up and you can talk to the audience. I look out at that crowd and they look like they had just been through a war there. I mean, they were, they had the blank stare, not one question. <laughs> like people just looked at me. It was so awkward. It was like dead silence. Like anybody got any questions? It's crickets. I mean, these people won't even make eye contact. Like they're oh. just so <laughs> offended by what they just saw. Poor sports. I know. And, <laughs> And so then once I got afterwards, I got outside and then people would come up to me. Hey, um, hey, so my girlfriend wanted me to tell you she really liked the movie. Um, that's her over there. Uh, anyways, congratulations. And then they walk away, they walk away <laughs> acknowledging that they that they like the film. But the incisure guys or whatever, the they they loved it. That's a great film. Actually, actually I'm, I'm going to have to post that one. I didn't write anything about it because I was like, oh, let me just let me watch a few more other things that he's done. I was so enthralled. I forgot to write anything down. I'm gonna have to watch it again <laughs> so I can post it. It was, that was a good ass movie. 
Yeah, no, that's the great one. Movie. Where, yeah, I think one of the comments was, "I should be killed before I'm allowed to make another film." I believe <laughs> one of the ridiculous one of, the, one of my fans from Amazon, apparently. Oh, Amazon! I I have problems with Amazon. <laughs> you know, anytime there's terrible reviews on Amazon like that, I purposely watch the movie and then I tell everybody else to watch it because those people they are not reviewing the movie. They have this whole idea in their mind of what the movie should be, and then when it's not that, then one star. And that's bull. What? What? That's not a review. And telling people they should die over a movie is dumb. So those are the ones that I end up liking because screw those people. What yeah, that's happen? why I put. Yeah. So obviously I put that in all the marketing material. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, I like this. And there's this one guy. He was a, a film reviewer uh, in the UK, which they showed it on their their horror channel. But he said that buddy his buddy has told him hey man you got to watch this film you know and he was like ah uh, you know I don't, i'm tired of watching these low budget films you know uh, so, and he was like no i'm serious you got to watch this film so he's like okay and he said he was just like screaming into his pillow at times and you know just completely freaked out by it and where it was going and he couldn't believe it and he was awesome. like yeah and he was like that was so much fun it was such a ride you know it and everything was, and was and I was like, well, thank you. you know. As graphic as that movie was, it wasn't that graphic. It was like the appearance of being much more graphic than it actually was. That was it, very well done. My, my thought process on it was that I, I, was, I was feeling like a lot of these films where they glorify the serial killer stuff. And I was like, you know, he's still a killer. Right. Like, there, is, like the, there is a dark side to death that you know, we, we tend to over. So that's why the first part of the film kind of makes it seem like it's gonna, we're taking light. And then by the second part where you really grasp like the, the severity of what this girl's doing. Right. And how, how personalized it becomes. Right. It is so good. And, and it's broken up really well by, who is that? Donnie? Yeah. So Donnie. crass and terrible. Yeah. But you need him to break it up because it's so heavy. Yeah. This if, idiot comes out being horrible <laughs> and disgusting. I'm like, I like this guy. This is great. Yeah, he does the podcast called <laughs> called Keith and the Girl. He and they've been doing podcasts since um probably two thousand and I think two thousand and three, maybe. Um oh. yeah, they've oh, they've um uh, they were some of the early like uh, one of the first podcasts I'd ever heard when it first started going. He him and his uh friend were doing it and they've been doing it out of New York since. Oh. And um yeah, so they've got a really, really big following and so I'd contacted him because I'd heard him on the thing. And, um, and I was like, Hey, you should come down here and be in this film. And he's like, I'd love to be an actor. And, and then he gets there and he just, he just, he would just eat that shit up. And he was just having so much fun. I you can tell actually, yeah. I was like, who is yeah. this guy? He's not acting. Who no, is this he's guy? Not. <laughs> <It's> not. <laughs> that was great. You quickly realized like that's him. He is yeah. Donnie. Yeah. That was great. Mm -hmm. so i'm definitely i definitely want to review that one because you know i know they're going to immediately be turned off by the cinematography but listen just 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 watch it just let it let it pour over you <laughs> that's a good movie and then you know moments like uh, you see shit in your trunk there are just yeah. there's just moments there's yeah, so those gems are, all over the place was, yeah i thought that was hilarious like it to was. me it felt like a comedy right. and then people were like i don't know man that thing's so horrible like you didn't get that joke like that I thought was, that was great that was one of my favorites <laughs> right yeah. and then when he answered the phone and he said this is rick i was like all right but that's okay it was still funny because yeah. i was like who's rick but it's my accent that's what it, that that's the problem right he's the guy the lead guy was from sweden sweden yeah so i'd met him on another project and um where this director was i was i, I went over there to work on this guy's project as a cinematographer and the director completely lost his mind and just just fell apart. Like I think he had a I think he had like a panic attack and a mental breakdown. And he just he wasn't showing up on set. He wasn't wanting to shoot anything. He wouldn't tell us what he needed, what we were supposed to be shooting. He didn't he he wouldn't give us a script. He kept saying that it was a it was more of an improv thing. But then he wouldn't tell us what we were improving. And so I worked with those actors and then afterwards we were like, gosh, we, we, I feel like we could have done something really cool. It sucks that we didn't. He was like, well, if you ever do anything else, let me know. And so once I got this project going, I got him and, you know, so he was, he's a pretty well-known actor um, in Sweden. And so he came over to do it. And um, 
So he was trying to hide his accent. So sometimes what you're hearing is every now and again, because we were working such long hours, he would get super tired and his, his accent would start to to come out. That's and right. So, he was really good. I was like, yeah, he was really good. He was really strong. Yeah. And Tara, the lady who played Tara, she was yeah. a writer on the 47 Hours to Live, right? Yes. She played the um, the girl in the, the nightclub. There you go. Right. Yeah. And then she uh, she also was a writer with me on the comedy that we did, um, The High Schooler's Guide to College Parties. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Which was another overly ambitious project that <laughs> got got out of hand without any money. And uh, I just feel like movies should have a lot of locations. Right. Okay. You know, I, I, get, I feel trapped if I'm in one spot for too long. Right. But unfortunately, when you're filming, moving locations is a big deal. Yeah. And so when you write it, it seems really easy. And then when you're on production and you're like, Hey man, we got to get out of here. We've got to move. And you're like, you got five more minutes and then we got to move. Cause we got to set up in another place. You're like, we just got here. <laughs> like, What's going on. Yeah. And that one was, you know, so that was another one that was pretty fun. My, uh, my entire crew walked out on me on the first night of that project. Oh. <laughs> so, cause they were like, this is never going to happen. There's no way you're going to fill this. You're going to finish this film. And you know, there's nothing we can't do we, we it's gonna fail and we're not we're done and they just left oh. and they left me with an entire grip truck unloaded in on the like 15th floor of a high-rise building and oh, so to quit. wow yeah and i was like oh shit but luckily got on the phone found the right people replaced them um uh, figured out how to put all the equipment back in the grip truck and uh we started the next day and it actually things went much smoother. The new crew was much cooler and much more fun to work with. And those guys were just assholes, which was a big lesson. It's like, if you have any negativity on the set, squash it, get rid of it. Because, you know, if it's negativity early on, man, by day 15, expect it to just be a complete nightmare. It makes sense. You know, so as soon as somebody seems like they're, they got attitude or they're giving you trouble, you gotta, you gotta get rid of them as soon as possible. Because even if they're really good, they're just going to, it's, it's going to poison the entire set. Yeah, makes sense. You know, imagine going on a road trip with somebody who's complaining the whole time. Oh. Like it oh. just brings down the entire, entire scene. So, you yeah. know, once, once you get the right people around you, then anything's possible. But right. if you have a bunch of people, it's like, we can't do that. That's not how it's done. We can't do that. That's impossible. Yeah. You know, then you're going to spend half your time just arguing when it could have been already done. Right. Which brings us to 47 Hours, yeah. which uh, was probably the toughest production I, I, I did, and it had the most money. I believe it, yeah. But um, we were dealing with a producer who was just fucking crazy <laughs> and would show up on set just screaming, <laughs> what the fuck's going on? Why the f what? How many, what page are you on? This is, you're not going to fucking, I'm going to fire you. I'm going to replace you. You're just like, oh, that's a good way to get everybody's morale up. Right? <laughs> Come God. here. Tell everybody, you know, we're all, we're all fucking gonna, you know, losers. And um, there was, uh, they, they were just like, their goal was just to get through it. Um, they didn't care like what, how it looked or what was going on. So you start to realize, okay, these guys, they're just, it's just about the money at this, you know, and they were trying to move, move forward with, so the money came from China and they were hoping to do other deals with this same Chinese company. So I think they were just trying to get ours out of the way. And he kept telling me, you know, I never wanted to make this project. I think this project sucks. I don't want to, you know, wow. I'm only doing it because we want to do something else. You're like, gee, way to, you know, instill, you know, a lot of uh, faith in, in this project. So yeah. it, yeah, it, it, that part of it was probably the most mentally challenging and difficult just to try to work up your, you know, but luckily the guy I, that I brought in as the DP uh, was a guy I'd worked with a bunch and, and he was like, I don't understand why you're bringing me in on this project. You know, there's a lot of people you could have, you could work with. And I was like, dude, I, I know what this is going to turn into. And I would just want to make sure I have people that I can trust and confide in next to me because that's that's where we're going to be at war trying to make this project happen and that's where um 
it paid off because, you know, there was days and it was like, if you didn't have somebody on your side, you would just like lose your mind. Right. And, um, you know, because like any project, it kind of comes down from the top. So who, you know, if the person at the top is acting crazy, it kind of spreads crazy throughout right. and people kind of start to, you know, it becomes less about something everybody's trying to do passionately and it becomes more about attitudes. I mean, there was a lot of people that, that, that kept it, you know, and they were extremely passionate and, and positive. And then there was, you know, the few that were just there complaining and causing problems. And I think it comes across in the product because if I were to judge the two 48 hours and she's crushed, it's night and day. And I don't even just mean in quality, but I mean in like the care, you can tell it, it was missing something. And I think part of it was pacing. Yes. But it was, I think passion might've been missing a little bit. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what happens when you get a lot of money and people just trying to get it done. Yeah. And there, you know, and then once it was done, most of my projects are made in post, you know, right. because especially when you don't have a lot of money and, right you know, reshoots, pickup shots, inserts, all those type of things, you know, kind of crafting scenes from, from the editorial point of view is, is where, you know, and I, and I, and I made that clear up front. I was like, guys, you know, this is a pretty ambitious project, even with the budget, you know, but at the same time, you have to have faith that we can, you know, that we're going to do after production, like this, the show's not done. We're going to, you know, we've, we can pick up a lot of the stuff. We're not going to pick up on the day, we're going to say we can anything that we don't need all the main talent for or anything let's try to push and do you know and then we'll let's schedule some days where we bring in talent just to do some inserts and pick up shots and fix some spots that there may be things lacking and you know and really craft a great film and they're like oh yeah that's that's exactly what we want and then as soon as production was over we're not going to shoot another frame nah. and it's like what nope we're if it's not in camera we're not we're we're delivering what we have and it's like, well, but the whole th- the thing was designed to be built after. Like, so you're, you're a huge chunk of what's going to make this movie great is gone. Yeah. And they were just like, nope, they don't want to hear it. You know, so I had to walk a very fine line because, you know, they didn't, I didn't, I didn't even get to see it after, you know, I did the rough cut, which I think I had like four or five days I worked on a cut and then I didn't see it again for three months. Oh, wow. And then they, they sent back this thing to do sound mix. And I was like, wow, that doesn't work. Where's the pacing? Where's like the, where's the, uh, where's the, the, the tension build? Where's all the things. And, right. you know, and they're like, well, you just didn't shoot it. I'm like, well, a lot of that's editing, like right. build up and like, mm-hmm. I mean, you, you need to, you know, and then I started going through and I was like, look, there is that shot. There is a shot of this happening and that, like you didn't use it well, you know, and some of the, some of the lighter moments they cut out that I thought were really funny. Um, oh, well, we just, you know, it didn't work like, well, but now the thing just seems like it's just, it doesn't have a sense of humor at all about anything. It just seems really kind of matter of fact. And uh, we got a lot of mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first one we watched, it definitely had a pacing problem because I was feeling lulled there. But then the link that you sent for us to watch, Uh much better pacing, much better. Like I would watch that one again for sure. The first one, can't do it. That lull that was putting me to sleep, can't do it. Yeah. Cause I mean, we'd even done, you know, cause I had a friend who, um, he has a, a screening room in his house. It's a really nice one. So we'd bring over people to screen it and, you know, which is how I like to work. And then you go, okay, what, what'd you guys think? What, you know, what you could feel when it's not working, like, you're like, okay, this is dragging. We gotta, we gotta go in and edit this and tighten this and fix this. Right. Um, you know, and even some of this stuff, you're like, oh, I really like this moment, but it's just not working. Let's get rid of it. Let's tighten it up. Let's get rid of some of the ums and the ahs. Like some of the stuff that they left in, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, let's tighten up just that. Like the scene's not bad. It's just, you're just letting it hang too long between like, I don't want to see this person stare at the other person for 10 seconds right? before they start talking again. It's like, let's t- tighten that up. You know, let's pace right. it up, you know, or some of the things they're saying is repetitive, right. which is stuff you find out when you're, when you're screening it. So we did like three screenings to get to the, you know, to, to chop it up and get to the place where, 
where you saw it. And then um, I went and added some, some shots and went and got some more establishing shots to try to build in a little bit more atmosphere right. for some of the places and things. And I think, it, you know, if we would have really, and this was me working off of a pre-existing cut where, which I was limited to what I could do because the sound mix had already been done. Right. So I'm working with stems of already mixed music. So I couldn't do as much as I'd like, but had, you know, if I would have had another month to work on the edit and really, really play with it and get, I think it could have, I think it could have really, really been a much more fun. And um, I think the, the vibe of it would have changed a lot right. more too. Well, where does that lie? Like, because you did that, that extra cut that you put it on YouTube. Like, is there, are you not allowed to release that? Yeah. I, because I don't own it. Um, so you know, I, tr and again, because every, you know, these guys are like, we're done, we're moving on, we're not spending another penny. And I said, yeah, but I've got this better cut. And they're like, well, I thought you'd already done a better cut. I'm like, yeah, but we're screening it and tightening it and fixing it. Like, if it hasn't been released yet, why don't we just keep making it as, you know, I'm doing all this on my own dime anyway. So like, what do you care? But they had already created deliverables. And I was like, well, why did you create the deliverables at this point? And I was like, I'll recreate them. I'll do it. Like I'll make the, the DLP or the DCP and all that, you know, all the, all the deliverable parts you need. Um, but they were like, nope, we're just going to send what we got. And, the, you know, and they made the deal. I didn't even know it, but you know, it was later that they're like, oh yeah, it's already done. We've already done the deal. We've already sent everything. I'm like, wait, what? Uh -oh. like, they didn't even give me an opportunity. I mean, we could have, I would have talked to the distributor and mm. you know found out what does he need like what does he need right out of the gate and let's you know let's get something going and you know and even the guy that was they did like a limited theatrical screening and i was trying to work with the guy that was doing that and he just became a real dick and i was like dude why are you you know why why is all this fucking attitude like how come we're not all in this together why, why aren't you more supportive but everything i asked her or wanted to do they it just seemed like you know like a huge put on them like oh what do you want to do now? Like what? Like, Oh, well, I, you know, and I, I was like, I was trying to create the DCP for him, which is the, the, the format that you have to use if you're going to screen it in a digital screening at a, at a theater. Right. Uh, and so there is a, you know, so I looked into it and it was going to cost me like eight grand to have one made. Mm -hmm. So I, I contacted some of, some of the filmmaker friends of mine that, you know, and uh, they, it's like, how do you guys do it? What are you doing? And they said, there's a free program that you can use. It doesn't allow you to do certain things. Like you can't put a time lock on it because some of the, some of the, them allow you to say, like, if I, if I send it to a festival, it will only unlock and let them watch it from a time frame that's set in the hard drive. So once they get the, the thing, they can only show it once and they can only show it at that time. That way they can't show it 30 times. You know, if they have a slot for it, it's programmed into the thing digitally and it's locked. Okay. The versions that the free versions doesn't allow you to have that much control, right. but it will allow it to play on those projectors in the format that those projectors need it to play. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, I was like, okay, I'll, uh, you know, I'll create another one. And I sent it to him. He was like, this doesn't work. This is a problem. I don't want to talk. And I'm like, dude, well, and it was his fault. He was, he was trying to, trying to read it with the, with the wrong program. And uh, you know, and he just didn't want to, like, he wouldn't get on the phone and talk about it or try to work through it. It was just like, you're an idiot. I don't want to talk to you. You sent me the wrong thing. Forget it. I'm done. Wow. Whatever. You know? And it's like, God dang, man. You know, I, I guess this, maybe that, that whole team of people and the people that they associated with were all just, you know, part of that same angry mentality or I don't know. It was, it was bizarre to say the least. It just, it, you know, it wasn't. So when I, you know, when sometimes you read these things, you, you know, some filmmaker and they're like, oh, that was such a hard project. Um, you know, I met Guillermo del Toro through a friend of mine and, you know, he was talking about the, the film when he did uh, Mimic, you know, and how it almost broke him and he didn't want to make films anymore. And I'm thinking, how? Like, it's a, you know, it's a great film. I mean, yeah, it has its problems. It may not be, you know, his you know, main work, but gosh, you know, like it seemed like it would have been a fun project and it, you know, it seemed like it had a budget, but now I know like, yeah, there's things that go behind the scenes that can just demoralize you and just beat you down to the point where, you know, especially when you see the potential of what you could do, 
and you know yeah man it's infuriating because i mean like that that other cut is just that much tighter and that much better that it's like when it's got such a wide platform like being on prime like it could have been that much more successful right like yeah and then like the the cover art was horrible you know i was like it it looks like a movie i wouldn't want to watch like it just looks so cheesy you know and i was like look around at some of the other films that are somewhat similar like they have cool cover art like why is this some funky monster style thing that i don't i don't even get well maybe it's because you're an artist and they are just not they just don't care get to the end of it and move on to the next one that's it they're they're into the for, for them it's a game of numbers yeah you know and they they start looking at how much time they're putting into it and they value their time like in they're just like no you know so for them if they put out 25 films and two of them do well that's it they're good 